If you have your Bibles, we're going to begin in Luke chapter 10. I want to talk to you about a singular event but I want to talk about three times that we see this person in the Bible that I'm going to share all three times that this person is spoke of in the Bible. And then the third time, I'm going to speak of what they did for Jesus that last week. You see, as we look at Christ that last week, I want us to look at not only what He did, but I want us to look at what He experienced because everything that last week was orchestrated by God, it was things that He did, but things that He experienced. And I believe it's what God wants us to experience. Something maybe we can be prompted to do as well. I want to talk about a person by the name of Mary. She had a sister named Martha. She had a brother named Lazarus. Most likely, she was the youngest of the three. They lived just outside of Jerusalem in a town called Bethany, about two miles from Jerusalem. And as was his custom, Jesus, when he was going to Jerusalem, would often stay there. It is said of Lazarus, that he was the one that Jesus loved. That meant Jesus spent much time with these three. We don't know all the experiences. We don't know when they met. But they became close, famous friends. Even the Son of God needed friends. People on earth to look at, to share with. No one is an island unto themselves. And of these three, these two sisters and brother, they all had their own personality. They all had their own strengths. Lazarus, we probably can just look at it and understand, he was probably, outside of the disciples, one of the closest confidants and friends of Jesus. Martha was a type A personality, most likely the oldest. Wanted to get things done. Uh, we would say she was probably a little bit of a control freak. She was built that way. She was always doing. Even in the first story that I will share this morning, they were together at their house and she was serving everyone that was there. Y'all know anybody like that? I call her Meatloaf Martha. Martha. If there was a, a, a church social, she was always going to have a casserole. Can I get an amen? amen? If you went to her house, she was going to feed you something. She was going to do something kind for you. But then there was the youngest sister, Mary, and she was the tender one. Quiet, introspective. Her heart was wide open. There's a one of the Psalms, one of the verses in the Psalms that says, my heart is wide open unto you, O Lord. That was Mary. She's the one we're going to look at a little bit. In Luke chapter 10, since we're going to look at so much Scripture, you can remain seated. It simply says this in verse 38. Now it happened as they went that he entered a certain village and a certain woman named Martha welcomed him into her house, most likely the Otis. She welcomed Jesus. And then whenever you welcome Jesus, you welcome the entourage of the disciples and the others that always were with him in his travels. She had a sister called Mary. And here's the phrase I want you to see. Who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was distracted with much serving. She is busy at work. She's got all of these things happen, happening, all these people to take care of. She is working in the kitchen. She's sweating it out out of love for everyone there. She was distracted with much serving and she approached Jesus and said, 
Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me alone? Therefore, tell her to help me. Tell her to get her lazy self up and get in the kitchen. She should be in there doing this, but she's, she's left the obligations. All she wants to do is sit at your feet. You see, Martha thought the greatest thing that she could do for God was serve. But in verse 41, Jesus answered and said to her, and by the way, I think Martha's tone may have been a little accusatory and harsh. It, it, it may, she may have been a little bit angry. Can y'all hear me? Do you hear her tone? But it changes when Jesus shares his tone. He said, Martha, Martha, twice he says her name. Almost you can hear him say, calm down, Martha. Martha, you are worried and troubled about many things. You're anxious. You're fretting. You're upset. You're letting this stuff get to you, Martha. But one thing is needed. And Mary has chosen that good part which will not be taken away from her. It's almost like Jesus is saying, Martha, I love you. But Martha, always worrying, always fretting, always thinking that you're, you're doing the best by, 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 by serving, but you're missing something. Mary's not missing that. Mary always finds a beeline to my feet. Martha, I love you. I appreciate you. But I'm not going to take that from her. I'm not going to take it from her. Take and look in the book of John, chapter number 11. This is the second time we hear of Mary in Scripture. This time, Lazarus was sick. They called for Jesus to come. They had seen Jesus in action. They had seen Him heal people. People with all kinds of sickness would come to Him. And by a word or by a touch or just by His presence, all the infirmities would flee. All of the needs were taken care of. So when Lazarus got sick, immediately that was their first thought. Hey, this is not going away. He's sick. He, he's still sick. This is getting bad. Find Jesus. They sent servants out. Find Jesus. Let him know that Lazarus, listen now, listen, whom he loves, is sick. The person finds him. The person tells them, but Jesus doesn't seem to be moved by it. I'm sure the others are saying, come on, gather the stuff. With, we got to go. We know how much Jesus loves Lazarus, but, but Jesus tarried. He delayed. He didn't seem to be fretted by it. Matter of fact, he told them that God was up to something just so that they would know and be aware of. And there came a time Jesus said, all right, let's go. And they began the walk. And by the time they got to the house, Lazarus was dead. They'd had the funeral. He'd been laid in the grave for days. And there, isn't it unique, all the people are at the house consoling this two sweet girls because their brother's dead. But Jesus doesn't come to the house. He gets close and stops. When Martha hears, Martha runs out to him. Lord, if you had been here, Lazarus would not have died. 
And they had a little theological doctrinal moment. And Jesus shared with Martha, don't you believe? Yes, I know these things to be true. You are the Christ. What an amazing statement. You're the Son of God. You're the Messiah. You're the promised one. Martha knew this. But got comfort from the Lord and went home. And when she went home, she looked at Mary and said, the Lord is here. He's calling for you. So Mary gets up and He's not come to the house yet. He's in the same place that he was when Martha met him. And she runs out to him. And it says there in verse 28, John chapter 11, verse 28. And when she had said these things, she went her way and secretly called Mary, her sister, saying, the teacher has come and is calling for you. As soon as she heard that, she arose quickly, came to him. Now Jesus had not yet come into the town, but was in the place where Martha met him. Then the Jews who were with her, that is with Mary, in the house and comforting her, when they saw that Mary rose up quickly and went out, followed her saying, she's going to the tomb to to cry there, to weep there. She's in sorrow. Let's go with her. Verse 32, then when Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, look at this phrase, she fell at his feet, saying, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. This wasn't scripted by the girls. This is just something that came from their heart. But once again, when when Martha said it, I believe there was a little bit of a tone. If you had not delayed, if you had gotten here quicker, I know you're busy, But Lord, if you had gotten here, my brother would not have died. But I think when Mary got there, she came. And once again, there was something about her when she got in the presence of God. Nobody told her to do this. She immediately fell at his feet and shared her heart. I believe in tenderness. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Because Jesus didn't correct her. He didn't have a theological doctrinal statement with her. He wasn't trying to sort things out. He just was moved. It says in verse 33, Therefore when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her weeping, he groaned in his spirit and was troubled. He cared. He cared. The third time we hear of Mary, I'm going to read you both accounts. It's in three accounts, but I want to read to you in two of the accounts. Look over in John chapter number 12, in verse number 1. Now, six days before the Passover, Jesus would be killed on the cross of Calvary before Passover, during the week of Passover. Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus, who was, had been dead, whom he had raised from the dead. There they made him a supper. Oh yeah, Martha serving. But Lazarus was one of those who sat at the table with him. Then Mary took a pound of very costly oil of spikenard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the oil. If you have your Bible, you can go over to Matthew chapter number 26. And I want you to read the same account in Matthew 26. We're going to begin in verse number 6. When Jesus was in Bethany at the house of Simon the leper. Now, he's not at Martha and Lazarus and Mary's house now. He's at a different house. 
the house of a man who was, was, y'all like the word was? When they taught me a little bit of English, the little bit of English they taught me, they said that was in the past tense. No longer there in the present tense. He was a leper. How does someone who has leprosy that cannot be healed have that in the past tense? They met Jesus. When Simon met Jesus, he found the power of God because Jesus healed him of that disease that was rotting his skin and his body parts away. The numbness, the feeling of those things would go away. Just the, the very body parts, his nose, his ears, his fingers, consumed by this where a, a finger may fall off. But when Jesus heals, listen to me now, he heals to the uttermost. He doesn't just do a patch job. When God heals, he takes you from the depravity of the, of the illness and the sickness to the totality of the perfection of God. You see, I don't think he just had healing of his skin. I think he had the most beautiful skin around. I got scars on my face. Man, of Lord, I got scars all over my body. I don't think Lazarus had a scar anywhere. You know why? Because God said, all the other stuff be gone. Let the new stuff come. What a glorious picture. Our Lord in his last week, he's there in the house. They're, 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 they're having good times together. There's probably some jokes being said. There's probably some stories. Jesus is probably sharing with them there. It's a wonderful time. There's another meatloaf on the table. Martha's in the kitchen. Everything is well. But Mary slipped off and came back. And I want you to hear what happens. It says in verse number 7, a woman came to him. John told us that his, her name was Mary. And she's got an alabaster flask of very costly, fragrant oil. John's accord talks about Judas Iscariot. He's mad about it. He said this would have been an entire year's wage to pay for this. Judas is saying, why was this extravagant waste? It could have been sold and the money could have been given to the poor. But Mary brought this alabaster flask. And verse 7 says, and she poured it on his head as he sat at the table. John's account says that it came down and she anointed it as it fell from his head and she anointed his feet with it because it says here she fell at his feet. In your mind's eye, I want you right now just to see her coming in. Everybody had known, they knew it was Mary. She's probably not the one that dominated all the conversations, but she came to him there at the table. And this flask would be broken. And the aroma filled the place. I believe the room got quiet. And Jesus would have sat up from the table and she would have taken this and began to anoint his head. And it would run down his face, the face that less than a week later would have blood flowing down that same face. And she comes with the way that we're supposed to come with all of her heart, all of her soul, all of her mind, all that she had, all of her strength. And as that 
precious oil fell and began to hit its feet. That was her favorite place. And she gets down on her feet and anoints her feet, his feet. And, and, and you have to understand in the Middle East, the woman would keep her hair up. She would never let her hair down except at night or in the presence of her husband. But Mary did not have that, so she takes those pins out that are holding her hair up and her hair falls down. And she begins to wipe his feet or literally to almost to just move all that around on his feet. I don't know what was more. The precious ointment from the flask that was poured out or the overflow of her heart that was poured out. She came to worship. She came with a purpose. You see, Jesus had been telling the disciples, we're going to Jerusalem and I will die. I will be crucified. But I will rise from the dead. He didn't say it just once. He said it over and over and over again. But listen to me. Everybody was hearing, but Mary was listening. When Judas Iscariot made that absolutely ridiculous statement, this could have been taken and sold and we could have fed the poor with it because he wanted to get, he, he was the keeper of the box and it, it tells us in John that, that he was used to taking that money and taking it for himself. But Jesus said, leave her alone. She has done a good thing thing to me her worship this was a good thing for she has anointed me for my burial worship folks is listening if you don't listen you're not going to worship what good does it do to have the Holy Spirit of the Almighty living within us? The Holy Spirit will always draw you to Jesus. He will always point to Jesus. He will always tell us of the opportunity that we have today to worship. But do we ignore that? Are we too busy? How many opportunities do we miss every day to come to the feet of our Lord and our Savior? I promise you, if Jesus walked in here in his personal presence with the nail-scarred hands and he stood here in front of you in the white robes of glory that us Christians will see one day, we hit our knees in worship. And yet... Is that not what we're supposed to do? Do we have to wait till we get to heaven to see him face to face? Can our heart not find him now? Let me share a few quick things. Mary didn't care that this was public. She came to worship publicly. I wonder how many times if we listen to the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is telling us to do things and we don't do them because it might be in front of other people and we're afraid of how we'll be seen. We're afraid of how someone will take it. We're afraid of what somebody will think about us rather than caring about the one in heaven and what he thinks about us. Y'all listen to me. I cannot tell you how many times people have come to me and said, you know, I thought about, but you just ruined it when you said, but. What would this church service be like? What would the people of New Holland be like if we could hear from God and we would act upon what the Holy Spirit tells us to do as we find our place in worshiping Christ? Oh, hold on. Let me just make a blanket statement to you. 
Worship that is true worship is contagious. Worship that is man-made, worship that is contrived, worship that is us tipping God, reaching into our pocket and giving him what we think he's worth that day, that's contagious too, but it's not contagious in a blessing of God. One person who is in true worship will lift up the praise of others. Others who are just holding back, who are just in the cold zone, that will bless others in a different way. Mary did not care. Now, let me just ask you real quickly. Who do you care most about? Do you care most about what Christ thinks or what others think? Number two, it was extravagant. Her worship was extravagant. Do you know what I mean with this when I say she held nothing back? Maybe when Jesus was there, maybe when the Spirit was telling her it was a great time, a wonderful time. Maybe she remembered what a prostitute did at the very beginning of his ministry. Maybe she went back to her house and she found that alabaster flask. And maybe she thought, maybe I can take just a little bit out. And then maybe she started thinking about all that God had done for her what Christ had meant for her. Maybe she is looking at it and she's saying, uh, uh, maybe I can do this amount. But something came in her that is the worship that was in her heart. And she said, how could I hold back for the one who has done so much for me? A twinkling of our moment that when we get inside heaven, we're going to know the price of our salvation. We're going to know the glory of it. But I promise you and I tell you, when we get before God in true, emphatic worship today, we, can, we don't have to wait till the twinkling of the time we're in heaven. We, our worship will bring us there and we will see the vastness of the value and the worth of Jesus. Extravagant. I promise you one thing. Mary looked back on it when he was on the cross and said, I am glad I had that time at his feet to worship him because now he's hanging naked on the cross, dying and bleeding, broken and torn by the whips for me. You may be extravagant, but if you do it for God, you'll never miss it. If you hold on to it and say, I can't give that up, you'll never value it. Money may value something to you, but there's something that has a greater value than anything else. Should. Should. Angie, how amazing that she went to work and said, we're raising money for Crisis Pregnancy Center. And they came. I looked at her bottle this morning. I said, what in the world? She had green stuff in there. It wasn't pennies. And I saw two zeros. I said, somebody put $100 in that thing. I'm, you know, preachers like, amen, praise God. I want to make her an usher. Let her pass the plate. Amen. She said $737. People will give to that which is important to them. People worship the one that is important to them. It was public. It was extravagant. By the way, she didn't ask permission either. She didn't say, Lord, would it be all right if my little girl, I love her to death. There was a time when I was in between a church and uh, we worshiped together. The only time I ever got to be sitting in a pew with my daughter and my wife. <clears throat> and it came time for the invitation. And, and the music director said, everyone stand. And Jody hit her knees. And she's down there on her knees in the pew. Or in the chairs. Between the pews, the, between the line. And she's down there on her knees just praising God. She didn't ask permission. 
She didn't come and say, Dad, do you think it would be all right if? <laughs> True worship is all right anytime. If you're waiting to get somebody else's permission, you're missing the one that matters. You're missing the one that matters. True worship is joyful. Have y'all ever had a spell before? Y'all know what? I'm not talking about you hit your head and you don't know where you're at. I'm talking about a time when you get in the presence of God and the joy of the Lord comes in that place and you may get happy. You may, I mean, tears may be flowing, but you're get happy. I've seen preachers have a spell right in the middle of a sermon. I watched a man in a worship service. He's now the pastor at New Haven over here. We were in a crusade. He was sitting in a chair on the stage. The choir was singing a song, Lee University. And he was sitting there. He was sitting down. And the guy sitting beside him was going to give the testimony. He was a great big black man. He was, a, he was a, a, the a chaplain at Clemson University. He was about that wide. He was about that thick. He was about that tall. And he was sitting in the chair beside him. And he was kind of like a percolator. Y'all remember those percolator coffee pots? They get going. He was sitting there going, yeah. 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 Then he got hitting the brother preacher beside him with his hand. And I saw a preacher on a stage sitting down, have a running fit. He was sitting. I can't do it. He was sitting there on that chair and he was going. <laughs> and he didn't care who was watching. He didn't care what anybody else. Listen, your praise is joyful. If it is praise unto the Lord, how can you think of the splendor of Christ without being amazed by the praise of His goodness? Can I say this? I think it was thoughtful. I think she was as sweet as sweet can be. And I think everybody else was looking around at her. And, and Come on, let's not even think about Judas Iscariot. The greedy one's over there. By the way, his greed got the other's disciples involved in that too. But don't you know some other people were looking at that and saying, that's one of the sweetest things I've ever seen. Now, pause. Hold on. Listen to me. What was Jesus thinking as he looked at her? Do you think a smile came across his face? Judas, hush. Leave her alone. She's doing a good work. She's anointing me for my burial. Why didn't you do it? Not only do I think Jesus was smiling, I think the Holy Spirit was captivating. And I believe the Lord in heaven, our Father, our God in heaven is looking down and He is saying the words that I pray that I will hear one day. Well done, my good and faithful servant. Worship. There are a lot of things we can't do. There's a lot of things I don't have the ability to do. I don't have the skill to do. I just don't. But I can worship. By the way, you can't steal my worship. You can't replicate my worship. I'm a fingerprint. I'm a snowflake. No one in all the world can worship like I can. And when God hears my worship, He hears my individual, single, soul, heart, bringing the glory unto Him. And nobody can replicate or replace your worship. You bring it. And if you don't, there's a voice missing from the choir of praise. I said to Dinah last week, I love Dinah when she's up here. Dinah's got a great voice. She's got a beautiful voice. But, but, but Dinah, it's not your voice. It's your face when you sing unto the Lord. Did I not say that to you? <clears throat> 
When she sings, it's not about the vocal. My dad, bless his heart, he couldn't sing a lick. We were a family of singers, but he couldn't sing a lick. He had all the jokes about it, but I tell you one thing, my dad, you couldn't steal his praise. He was going to sing, he was going to sing, he was going to sing. Now, I got a nephew, my brother, Wade, his son, Patrick. Now, my brother can sing. Oh, my goodness. What a voice. Patrick's like my dad. He didn't get it. He's got long hair. He keeps it in a ponytail. Most of the time you see him, he's got a hat on and all these big ponytails underneath his hat. But when he gets up in church, he could care less what anybody else thinks. He's going to raise his hands, and he's going to sing the most ungodly tunes you've ever heard of. But I promise you this, in heaven, God's saying, boy, that sounds good. If we quit worrying about anybody and everybody other than the King of kings and Lord of lords, I think it'll be sweet. Sweet. Where's our worship? How long has it been since you found yourself at Jesus' feet? How long has it been since you had time in prayer that lasted over 60 seconds? How long has it been when you sat down and you started to talk to the Lord and you started to tell the Lord your heart, you started to tell the Lord how, how, how much He meant to you, that time just stood still? Look, I have prayed sometimes for hours, got up from my prayer and looked at my watch and it had been five minutes. Y'all hear me? Did you catch that? And I have spent some time in prayer that seemed like a few minutes. Then when I got up, hours had passed by. Because when you step into true worship, you step into eternity where time doesn't matter. What matters is taking your heart and just pouring it out before the Lord. How long has it been? Three times we hear of Mary. All three times we find her at the feet of Jesus. Can that be said about us?